the research was and how little industry was prepared to do in order to get its foods on the market as quickly as possible and expose them to human beings. He said at that moment he realized that what industry was doing and what he was doing, which was safety testing, was diametrically opposed. And it was a turning point in this very pro-biotech scientist's life. He called up the minister and said, I wasn't planning to give you a strong recommendation at this point, at this point after only two and a half hours, but I have to say, there is definitely not enough information here to allow these foods to be fed to human beings or to animals. The minister said, I don't know why you're telling me this. Your professor's committee approved these two years ago. They were already on the market. Now here is the catch. One, the potatoes would have made it to the market. Our pot pustai's tomato potatoes that hurt those rats would have made it to the market had they been submitted to that superficial research. They never tested for the things he tested for. Here's the second one. The soy and the corn and the tomatoes that were approved were never tested for that, which means they could be creating the same thing in rats, if they're willing to eat it, and in human beings. So that's the sobering point about long-term safety testing. There's only been one real, and it was only preliminary. I mean, when he found out the results, he contacted the very pro-biotech British government and said, we need to have more money to investigate the cause but they didn't give him any more money. In fact, when they fired him, they dismantled the team, stopped doing the work, and there is no independent long-term safety testing program. But we still have those same evaluation from the FDA scientists. Allergies, toxins, new diseases, antibiotic-resistant diseases. Here's an interesting one, antibiotic-resistant diseases. When you take a, a gene from one species and you blast it into a pile of cells, you have no idea which cell gets your gene into the DNA. You can't put it under a microscope. It's too small. So what they do is they put into the, they attach to this gene what's something called an antibiotic resistant marker gene, ARM, arm, an arm gene. And they blast that in, and then once the cells get this 22 caliber blast, they douse it with antibiotics. If the cell, the arm gene, gets into the DNA, it, resen it, re it renders it invincible to antibiotics. So those genes, that, those cells that survived, got the genes into their DNA. And that's why you put this antibiotic resistant marker gene, and that's the only time it's used. When the flavor saver tomato, was first being approved by the FDA, it was the first crop back in the early 90s, they asked the Division of Anti-Infective Drugs what they thought about introducing an arm gene. The director wrote a comment, a memo entitled, The Tomato That Will Eat Akron. In all capital letters, he said, it would be a serious health hazard. Why? Because that antibiotic-resistant marker gene just might jump off of the food that we eat onto the bacteria in our stomachs and intestines. Bacteria is very promiscuous. They could pass that gene on to pathogenic bacteria, and all of a sudden we have pathogenic bacteria accidentally genetically engineered to resist death by antibiotics. The response by the biotechnology industry to this threat, which, by the way, was one of the reasons why the British Medical Association called for a ban on genetically modified foods. The biotechnology industry said, not to worry, DNA is destroyed during digestion. This was one of a very long list of assumptions that have been proven wrong. And it's a very interesting study how they proved it wrong in human beings. They took seven volunteers. This was a British government study. This is the only human feeding study ever done except the big one that we're all part of. Which, by the way, the same British government's agency wanted to monitor. They contacted the Safeway and other executives from the big retail chains in England and said, you have loyalty card program, and so you have the records of 30 million consumers. We've got the medical records. We want to see if those eating genetically modified foods have higher levels of cancer, childhood allergies, and birth defects. Since they had previously announced that they were 
um, that GMOs were safe, when this information was leaked to the public, the embarrassed government decided not to do the follow-up. So we actually don't have any monitoring of that sort. But they did do this study where they took seven human volunteers, and these volunteers had colostomy bags. They had their lower intestines removed, not for the study. <laughs> and they fed these volunteers soy burgers and a soy milkshake. The soy is genetically modified. Remember, it's herbicide resistant. It doesn't die when it herbicide is applied. So the first thing they did is they looked in the colostomy bag and, fed, and found that they were totally surprised at how much intact DNA made it through past the small intestine. Then they took the bacteria out of the colostomy bag and they put it in different dishes and they added herbicide. And lo and behold, for three of the seven volunteers, their bacteria survived. It's also possible that another genetic construct that they put in with the gene before they do the blasting, that that also jumps. Now this construct is called a promoter. Let me explain why they use promoters. If you take a gene out of bacteria and you blast it into a soybean, that gene will just sit there. Even if it gets into the DNA, it will do nothing. Because, as you all know, there's a little man behind the DNA that controls all the genes. And it pushes some up and pushes some down, but has no idea what to do with this new gene. So, they take a piece of a virus, which is known to overpower this guy's control, and it turns on the gene 24-7 high volume. And it's attached to the gene, and it, get blast, it gets blasted in together. The theory was, this is another one of those assumptions that have been proven wrong, the theory was that the promoter will only turn on the gene to which it's attached. But guess what? Sometimes it turns on genes down the DNA, even on a different chromosome. And it can pump out proteins 24-7 high volume in spite of this man's objection. So what could possibly be the results of pumping out a protein 24-7? We've been through this list. Allergens, toxins, carcinogens, new diseases, nutritional problems. It could be great. It could kind of end up turning on the master gene. Or it could be worse. Now, there are some scientists that believe that if this promoter gene jumps onto our internal organs, it might create unregulated cell growth, which could lead to, right, cancer. Now this particular scientist that I quote, Dr. Stanley Ewan, he was the one that actually examined the inside of Arpad Pustai's rats and found extra cell growth. Those are a couple of the 21 read ways in which genetically modified foods can create unpredicted side effects, which is in my second chapter. So let's change modes here. We've kind of worked our way down into the depths of possible problems. I can also mention some other things. For example, the, the corn currently on the market would probably certainly not pass the World Health Organization's recommended tests for keeping allergens off the market that are genetically modified. There's a lot of implications that it should never have been approved. And we'll talk about, we won't talk about some of the other ways in which studies were rigged to avoid finding problems, some of the eight out of the 10. But let's talk about what we can do. Now, I personally believe that genetically modified foods are one of the most serious threats to health and the environment. I also think it's one of the easiest battles to win. We don't have to convince the Bush administration of anything. They pretty much have bought the biotech line, as did the administration before them. Dan Glickman, former Secretary of Agriculture for the Clinton administration, a big, um, big pro-GMO guy, a big cheerleader, went around Europe trying to sell G American GMOs to Europe. He said before stepping down in an interview, what I saw generically on the pro-biotech side was that the technology was good and that it was almost immoral to say that it wasn't good because it was going to solve the problems of the human race and feed the hungry and clothe the naked. And if you're against it, you're Luddites, you're stupid. And that frankly was the side our government was on. And you felt like you're almost disloyal and alien by trying to present an open-minded view. So this is an indication of the thinking of the government. 
which means maybe they're not liars